Welcome to another episode of Morelia Python Radio, and in this episode, we are joined by the one and only Tim Morris. Tim is known for his green tree python named Mr. Blue. We discuss the early days of chondros and how Mr. Blue came to be. I, I, I always enjoy hearing about the history of the bloodlines of special animals. Hopefully you do too. This is episode 550. Let's get into it. I never see it. <laughs> well, you never listen. No, therefore, <laughs> apparently you listen to Reptile. Reptile well, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I pop in to various podcasts to do like, you Guess know. what's going on. I that's know, it's the, just, a, you know, it's, it's quality control. And then yeah. every once in a while I pop in on them and they all, y'all start talking. And then inevitably one person is like, it's okay. Or one doesn't listen. In this case, it was Dr. Julander and uh, Rob Stone. And I was deeply hurt. That was so, hurt, yeah, hurtful. That was hurtful. mean. One thing that's coming from me, but you know, to come from the doc. You know, I know it's. Maybe it he was, didn't have a sweet lady DDP that day. I, well, was, you know, he was a little just, on edge. It's kind of like you know when they eat the Snickers bar. All of a sudden, they're a oh yeah, person. That must be it. I, either way. I'm just, and I even named him my reptile personality of the year, and I'm, I'm man. See how taking far that, that got you? Yeah, it was a weekend, hey, several weeks in. Well. Me and Owen are uh, determined to make NPR happen every week. So here we are. I'm sick as a Again. dog. I'm so sick. This is the level of sickness that I had. I was telling Owen before we started. Deeply concerned. That I haven't had coffee in two days. And I'm Deeply drinking concerned. tea. Deeply I'm drinking concerned. tea. That's what I'm you, drinking. You could be a pod person. Tell me something <laughs> only Eric Burke would pod know. Plant? <laughs> yeah. Either one. Yeah. Uh, this is a, you're a deep fake. Somebody put you in there. <laughs> conspiracy theorists the gecko people are trying to get uh, what yeah exactly no yeah so i'm gonna power through this as as best we can and uh owen is what a couple days away from heading out to florida to do i have i have tomorrow to get ready i have to get everybody ready (laughs) tomorrow it's like i'm like i took the day off to get to get everything ready and i'm like i'm gonna have to wake up at like 6 a.m. the normal time <laughs> i'd have to like you know Son of a bitch. i'm gonna have to, like do everything that i gotta do and it's like yeah yeah and we're in the middle of um melissa and i uh are finishing the attic so we can get some more storage space and stuff oh yeah and Said the father-in-law was coming the oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. My, my father-in-law came this okay. weekend Thank he God did. he was here because he did it. It took like two, three hours for us to do it. Yeah. If he hadn't been there, Melissa and I could do it. It would have taken several more hours. And if we had brought my gym, it would have been counterproductive. <laughs> so, you know, it was, yeah. Because <laughs> uh, uh, Melissa's father. would have been also, taking steps back. <laughs> right. Melissa's father is also named Jim. So uh-huh. it's my gym and her gym. And yeah, I just, I keep mine very far away from these things. So. <laughs> Yeah. Oh man. Yep. How's he doing, by the way? Is he doing He's okay? Fine. I mean, it, it's one of those. He has the heart thing. Um, they had him do an ablation where they electrocuted him until he still his heart stopped it. I, I mean, I imagine the doctor's just like, knock it off, and like you know. <laughs> And uh, he messages me, and he's like, "I have a list of food I'm not allowed to have," and my doctor says it's for my heart. And the best way I can think of getting rid of this food is I'm going to eat it all. I'm like, please don't. <laughs> I have three pounds of bacon. This is a very bad idea. <laughs> like it is. <laughs> it's exactly what you don't want to do. Yeah, what do you do? Their heart attack happened, Jim. Well, I tried to eat three pounds of bacon. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <clears throat> so. Oh, that's great. Yep. Yep. Okay. Yep. He's doing his thing. So, yeah. So, we're going to have Tim Morris join us in a bit. We're doing a Herp History episode that we're going to be talking about Mr. Blue in the early days of Chondros. For you, uh, Chondro people, you know. Yeah. Owen's favorite right before like, we, well, uh, you know, get ready to head out <laughs> for his trip. It's, and that's the thing is that there's so many gears. It, I gauge my love of animals or my want for certain animals on whether or not I can get them out of my head. Right. And, I have seen some gorgeous chondros, but they very quickly are replaced by other things. Right now, those Winmina scrubs that Lucas has are just oh front and center. They can't get out of your brain. brain. And I'm like, 
Yeah, but thank God I don't have any space. I, I have think no space in this house. I think that the the thing with Condros with you and me is that we've just had terrible luck with them. I oh, I blame it on myself. I'm not blaming it on the snake. I blame it on myself. I but mean, it, yeah. I I can't speak for Owen, but I, no, I don't I don't blame the snake. It didn't set up anything, but I just when you have an animal and you just have you have a really nice gut punch after you've kept them. Yeah. And it, it sometimes it takes the taste out of it. And I think that is the true you know, that that's where the the rubber meets the road is if after a massive gut punch do you still love the animal? And I think I just Condros and me just it didn't which is yeah. fine, but you still can appreciate them. I can. You know? I totally yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think they're yeah, gorgeous. Yeah, I love yeah. the high yellow stuff. You know, everybody else yeah. is like oh, everybody else is like high black, high purple. I'm like, yeah, high yellow. Yeah, man. I'm with you. Scales of green. Yeah. Oh my yellow. god. Like yeah. I remember people posting on the MP forums the canaries. Yeah. Those like bright yellow ones. And I'm like, yeah. okay. Chuck me- Vogel still works with them. Yeah. He, yeah, man. He has some really, really nice ones, but what is it? It's lemon tree. Well, lemon tree is it just a line? That's not, yeah. Uh, I, I like that line though. It's a good line. I don't even know if that line exists anymore. I don't even know yes. either. I don't I'll have think... to ask him when he when he. Yeah, gets, he, he might. He here. might be like that's. Dog I'm sure he knows. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so anyway, so. if uh, I'll try to mute myself as much as possible, but if I sound weird or whatever, that's why. That's if because I'm drinking tea from... and not coffee. If Take you don't hear out. from Eric after a while, it's because he's passed out. I can see him, and I'm trying to keep the show going as the paramedics work on him. Yeah, so, it will be similar yeah. to the Scrub episode in 2011. Here, no, no, <laughs> no, no. I'm just like, <laughs> no, I'm just no, because there was no visual. As the show no. is just running, and Owen's like, I know nothing about Scrubs. What do I do? <laughs> there, there was no visual with that, so I yeah. just had to be like, okay, no, and yeah no thank you let's not relive that so okay anything else you want to ramble about before we get uh tim i I spoke to jason balen today uh he's excited about the hamburg show coming up and then he and i complain to each other about how our season is weird and we don't know what's happening basic normal breeding season stuff so i'm telling you man it's it has to do with the el nino now, oh, dude, I, I'm telling you, that's and that I completely agree. I completely agree. I have no idea what's going to happen. My carpets have now finally stopped looking at the male that is entering their cage with murderous intent, <laughs> which I enjoy. I, I appreciate that. Yeah. You know, let you know they're still alive. <laughs> I, dude, I went to separate them and I had to hook the male hypo out of the cage you know like in the old cartoons when someone was doing so bad and the hook would come in from the side and <laughs> yank him yeah. off stage i did that yeah. to him just because i had to get him out of the line of fire he goes flying over there i close the cage because she's hitting the glass and i just pick him up put him in a cage Ugh. i don't know if i want to breed her anymore she's evil i don't know if i should which one is this ted Thompson? tiger yeah yeah, the, the Ted Thompson one. Oh yeah, the Ted Thompson tiger. That she's thing just, is evil, man. She's a horrid creature. Yeah. I'm like, why am I? She gives carpet pythons a bad name. Bad <laughs> why am I letting your? She's Adam, definitely plays into the stereotype. <laughs> that snake definitely plays into the stereotype of I have them being be vicious. White lips, like it is ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, it keeps anyway. you on your toes. So, all right, let's get Tim in here and let's get this going. Hey, Tim. What's happening, guys? You are. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, yeah everything's we got good. Yeah. Cool. Glad to uh, be able to talk to you about uh, some Condro history and, and early days and uh, yeah, blue to line shake, and stuff. shake the cobwebs out a little bit. <laughs> I, I, I think we need to do that every once in a while because otherwise people just are like, this is, it's always been here. It's always been like this. It's always been this easy or stuff like that. And it's like, you got to go back to kind of revisit to when it wasn't so easy every once in a while to appreciate it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I guess, t- I mean, I know a lot of people have heard this story before, but, I, you know, take us back to, uh, you know, how you got into Condros and what the early days were like and how Mr. Blue came about and all that kind of stuff. Well, so the early days for me are, are probably like the midway point, I guess, as far as as far as like the, uh, you know, like the Trooper stuff and the Eugene stuff and whatnot. I got into it around 91, I think. Okay. Um, I mean, I've been into snakes and herps and stuff prior to that, but 
it wasn't until I got a hold of that, uh, you know, the reproductive husbandry book, the Ross and Marzak, where, um, you know, a whole new world opened up really. Cause a lot of the things that were in that book at the time yeah. weren't really, I mean, you just didn't, I mean, maybe saw a few things here and there in the zoo, but just all the information about breeding and the reproductive mm-hmm. biology and everything like that. I mean, just was, I mean, it was, it was like mind blowing. It was like something you dream of getting your hands on and then there it is. And then, you know, through, you know, just combing through the pages, you know, looking at the photo credits, there was a photo credit for this guy trooper. And of course, you know, these were some of the first pictures I remember seeing of, you know, green tree pythons. And, you know, I think anybody would say that most people probably can remember the first time they, they saw one, whether it be a picture or one in person. And even to this day, even though I don't, keep them anymore um you know i still do some shows i mean i still have a bunch of different things just not um not any chondros but um you know i, I recently did a, a a table at a, a repticon show here in baltimore and just watching people because a friend of mine was vending and he had a bunch of chondros i mean they were they were clearly the attention grabbers no matter who walked past your table it just they just were in all of these yeah. You know, mm-hmm. snakes, you know. So, I mean, there's there's certainly that allure that that draws you in. And then, of course, when I realized that, you know, this guy was down at the National Zoo being, you know, 30 or 40 minutes from my house, you know, I garnered up my nephew, Sean, who was once into the chondros and did a bunch of the poison frogs. And now his brother, Christian, is, you know, taking the taking the ball and run uh, with mm-hmm. it, so to speak. Um, so we went down there and tracked Trooper down and. <laughs> Oh man, it was funny times. And I mean, he didn't know us from a, you know, a hole in the moon, but somehow we ended up in his good graces. And, um, I wound up, uh, thereafter volunteering. They had these summer like volunteer programs okay. and I was, I was in college at the time. So I, um, you know, found out about these programs and, and applied and, and got in. And, and to me, that was, that was awesome because I was hoping to, you know, pick his brain about these, you know, snakes and with a little luck, maybe get into some. Um, And, you know, and for, I guess, I I don't know if there's anybody out here that doesn't know. I mean, I I know everybody knows who Trooper is, but um, many people may not know about him, like interpersonally. Mm -hmm. And he's a guy that has a heart of gold, but it, it takes a while and some patience to sort of work your way to that level. You know, he's very cautious, you know, very sort of, um, I would say standoffish, but just very cautious about who he lets into his inner circle, you know. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, just to illustrate that point, my second summer, or maybe it was my first, I can't remember, volunteering down there, it was, you know, getting into August and the Raiders Expo was coming around. And I remember we were sitting upstairs in the staff lounge and I had asked him if, if he was going to the show and he said, yes. And I asked him, uh, you know, I told him that my fiance at the time and I were planning to go down and we were really interested in chondros. And I asked him, I said, well, do you have any to, that you're going to be selling? He goes, nope. <laughs> <laughs> and I looked at him and I'm like, God, I just busted my ass here for like two months of the summer, you know, and, and this is what I get. So, <laughs> So, and then he looks at me, he goes, well, you know, Tim, I just don't sell to anyone. And I'm like, God, okay, well, okay. From scratch those two questions. All right. I just, (laughs) or that question or whatever. So we go down there and of course he's down there with Eugene and I had no idea. I'd never seen a show on that scale ever before. Right. And, um, and that, you know, along with the Marzak book is another eye opening experience. So, um, so my fiance, who had gotten to know him a little bit, and she doesn't hold any punches back. So she walks up to him and says, so you just don't sell to anybody, do you? Because I told her, obviously, what, what happened. Mm-hmm. So anyways, <laughs> we were in the market to buy one. And she liked the yellows. I liked the reds. And this is way before I never, ever knew anything that I knew about yellow versus red. Mm-hmm. Um, so we were going to buy this yellow but then he talks her into a maroon, you know, stating that they go through a more dramatic color change. Mm-hmm. Um, 
And so, so we pick out this maroon, and then he later switches her because at the time, you know, back in the early nineties, you know, the standard price was pretty much seven fifty. Okay. Um, right. You know, Trooper and Eugene had sort of like some yearlings and older ones that were much higher prices. Okay. Um, mm-hmm. But they did have a couple other like larger like neos that were a little more money. So he drags out this bigger animal. It's like twice the size Mm -hmm. as a baby. And he shows it to her. He goes, I think you may want to take this one. And she's like, why? And he said, well, because it's bigger. It'll probably make it back to Maryland. Where, you know, I mean, all of them them made the car ride down there, right? But so she she goes for it, you know. She's like, why should I pay $200 more? Because he wanted nine fifty for it. Right. But anyways, that that turned out to be, um, you know, one animal that we picked up. And then the next day when I was hanging out the table, he that's when he gave me the um, um, the animal that eventually became, I guess, known as the legend male. Okay. Um, he was the right. sire to the blue male. And he gave that to me. It was actually a runt. Um, it was a twin, you know, part of a twin hatching. Yeah, and yeah. The, the, the egg mate died and... So he had raised it up and he was basically telling me the whole time that, you know, I don't think this snake's going to amount to much. I know you'll give it a good home. And, and so I think he wound up sort of wishing he'd maybe kept that animal, but, <laughs> um, you know, yeah. and I remember periodically the following summer taking in like sheds, you know, saying, Hey, look, this thing's growing really well. And then I also broached the um, topic because it turns out that that animal which actually turned out to be um, a, a sibling, not a litter mate, but a sibling uh, to the computer chondro. And um, the, fem- the the other animal that we bought from him for 950 bucks turned out to be a female. Okay. Um, but they were siblings. They were they were litter mates, basically. That that twin came out of the same litter as a female that we bought. Okay. So I'd asked him if he'd be willing to trade because I wanted to you know, try to breed something with a different bloodline if I could. And that's where the trade took place, where he took that female, which actually turned out, um, he's pretty sure that it was set for albino. It was in that same sort of litter where that albino gene was lurking. Sure. Mm -hmm. notes to a lot of people. Um, And the reason for that, just fast forward quickly, was that years later when he finally bred that female, he had a, a baby that died in the egg that had red eyes. So, okay. um, you know, he was pretty certain. I mean, it was not, it was close to full term. So it was pretty much all colored, but you know, he, he thought that it, it likely was a, it was an albino, but it was the only such one in the, in the whole litter. Mm-hmm. Um, but anyways, that's when he gave me the sib to, um, uh, powder. Okay. And that turned into the, so-called blue female okay. um and then from there i mean there was the only pair of condors i had so i bred them in 95 they produced the first litter in 96 of which mr blue became one of those animals out, out of that um clutch but I, I had no idea what i had in that sure and i'm not sure you know up to that point i mean i guess there were blue snakes you know al Zulich had a famous blue female mm-hmm. which was likely you know hormonally blue and mm-hmm. it wasn't uncommon for females, especially to turn, you know, blue after, you know, having a, a litter or two. So, um, so we had no idea. And even as a, as a baby, Mr. Blue was different than any, anything else in the litter. Um, How so? And that, well, it's just, it didn't, ha- he, he hardly had any markings on him. Ah, okay. He had very little markings. He had a couple very little, tiny little black outline specks of white you know, along the backbone. And that was pretty much it. And he was very, you know, relatively dark and, you know, so he was different. So, um, do we oddly think enough, the, uh, I'm sorry, ahead. Tim, like, do you think that maybe lack of pattern is something that somebody should look for in a Neo to kind of, when they're looking for something that might be a little bit standing out ish? Yeah, I, you know, it's possible, I guess, because mm-hmm. I guess the only reason I say that is because several years later, you know, I produced another uh, animal that wasn't as high blue as Mr. Blue was, but he was fairly blue. Mm-hmm. And he also had 
minimum pattern. Hmm. Um, but I mean, that's, you know, a very small sample size, but right. um, it's funny because, you know, back then after all that transpired, you know, everybody that's buying something from you as a baby they're like, pick me out something that's going to turn blue. I'm like, if I could predict <laughs> I that, really, yeah, if I, I could predict that, yeah, we'd be paying a little bit more for it. But um, yeah, I mean, I had some crazy pattern babies that just turned out to be plain green. So yeah, right. you know, <laughs> did they? Um, what well, I know, like you're saying at that show uh, where, where you picked the animals up, but what was it like to see chondros on the table? Was everybody? Was that like the first time that? Herp that was the herp first herp time I had know? ever seen, oh, you know, okay. them. I mean, I think Eugene and Trooper have been doing this for a while up mm -hmm. to that point. Right. And I think that was, I think the first show I went to, I believe was the second show. It was still in Orlando, but I think they had a show there the year before. And I believe they were there. Okay. Um, I'm not a hundred percent certain on that. I just remember like the early day. I remember for me, it was Angolan pythons. I don't know why, but like I would walk around the show and everybody's into these ball pythons. And this was in the, the like maybe 99, something like that. I'm walking around and I would just be like, oh my God, what is that? That is so cool. You know? Yeah. I I, I just wonder like, were you always, um, were you always a python guy or were you just, did you just have a... <sighs> Well, so the first, yeah, the first snakes I ever had were, I think I was in late middle school, or just anything you find in the pet store, I think probably right. garter snakes, green snakes, that kind of thing. Right. And none of them thrived. I, I probably, as much my fault as just being probably likely a wild caught animal that just would have been hard to get going anyway. Yeah. Right. Um, my first like, like snake that I bought from someone was a king snake, I believe. Mm. Okay. Um. And then after that, um, I think that wound up escaping. And then, af <laughs> and then after that was a was a berm, but before the berm actually got a retick. Now this is, God, this had to have been mm, probably eighty. So it was a pleasant 86. retick, you know. <laughs> no, it was, it was not. It was no, a baby. Not at all. <laughs> yeah, no, it was it was a baby, and and I wanted a. I wanted a Burmese python, but the guy didn't have it um, yet. Right. And it's from Larry Kenton. You probably know the name. Yeah, yeah. I know the name. Yeah. yeah, you know Larry. Everybody knows Larry. Anyway, so he lived in Maryland at the time. So he didn't have any. He said, hey, I got some retics. And at that point, I mean, there was no information on these animals other than you knew they got big. Sure. Mm -hmm. So I think within a month, I realized that um, – yeah, I need to find a way to exchange this for a Burmese. I mean, a little over my skis. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, right. I mean, just, you know, you couldn't handle it without gloves on. I mean, it just, and it was cool looking, it had sort of those like orangey eyes, you know, and, mm -hmm. sure. you know, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, you just, you could just tell. And it just wasn't very, um, it was smart yet untrustworthy. <laughs> which is a bad combination. It's the best combination <laughs> in a very large snake. Yeah, I love that. You know, so and this was a baby, so I mean, it wasn't much more than probably a foot and a half long, I guess. But what are you going to do when it's twenty exactly. feet? Right? Well, yeah. exactly, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah no. I, I, so anyway, dad, it was a Burmese back then. That was my first, I guess. You know, the bigger snakes. Yeah, yeah. Me too. Yeah. My dad had a couple wild caught retics, and whoo! I was like, no. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, to, you know. So then so, after that, um, just to quickly finish up the early yeah. snakes. So then after that, um, went to this pet shop in Maryland. They had this emerald tree boa, huh. um, which was a wild caught, but I bought it. It actually did really well. Then my net, well, then Sean wound up getting a female and we tried to breed those. And it was such a funny thing. So it was like the first, um, these were before the chondros. I mean, this is like, mm -hmm. I think I had a baby rainbow boa Brazilian that I bought from Peacall. And then we had these two emerald tree boas, Northerns, right? And we had built these big, you know, four foot tall enclosures, you know. Um, my fiance painted this like really cool, like tropical rainforest, like mural background. Sure. And, and I remember Sean and I were saying, all right, lining up our, our, our night, we were going to introduce them. 
So he rolls over with his, you know, big enclosure to my apartment. We set these things up. We got a case of beer, two chairs. We're sitting in front. We put them together. And we're just waiting. And we're waiting. And we're waiting. And it was like hours later, we realized, you know, maybe this is just not going to happen in the first night, you know. Yeah, right. <laughs> so, yeah, that, that was pretty funny. That was probably low, late 80s. Yeah, probably like 89, 90. Jeez. God, yeah. man, that, that was funny. I, th- I think, I think like, uh, I think that book, you know, is so underappreciated on how much effect that had on uh, just how everybody people, at the time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, yeah. honestly, everybody, I mean, that thing unloaded information that just was never seen. Yeah. And I know that Vivarium magazine was just getting going, I guess, around the same time. Sure. But it wasn't that widely circulating yet. So I didn't, I mean, I didn't even know anything about the Vivarium until probably you know, um, you know, that like the third, the third go around the third, whatever you call it, the third edition. Right. You know? Um, so, but yeah, that, 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 that was like a Bible. Hmm. And there was one that was published before. Like I got the hard cover edition, which was the second release, but there was a prior edition that was released, I believe in like 89. Yeah. When we had, uh, uh, Dick Ross on, he was talking about, uh, um, I think it was called the Python breeding manual or something like that. Yes. That's what yeah. it was. Yeah. And that was a great episode, by the way. That was awesome. <laughs> oh yeah. I'm pretty sure that was the one you guys did the one, right. Where he was talking yeah. about yep. having these like wooden cages in his basement. <laughs> and then the and power he's like, out, that's how he yeah. his white lips. It's like, Oh, that's cool, right. thanks. I've just been trying for 10 years. <laughs> yes. That was, that, that was an amazing, I mean, that, that was an amazing episode. He got mad about his um his herp stats where he's like I don't understand it I hate the thing and so I'm yeah. just gonna I'm like it's a herp stat or whatever but I can't argue with him because yeah. I won't but he know. said I had some big snakes in a, like a small apartment or something and got mm-hmm. evicted and yeah yeah, yeah I still yeah. remember some tidbits yeah. from that. Story of the Ring, ring Pythons. Yeah, was his yeah. Pythons. <laughs> his book. Oh like, my god! Yeah, so love that. Uh, great stuff. But okay. um, so I, I, I would say that I it, it used to be I, I, I kind of missed the idea of seeing chondro breeders at shows. Um, I don't really necessarily ever see a dedicated chondro breeder at a lot of the reptile shows that I attend or vend. And that's Hamburg, um, you know, uh, Oaks and uh, white plains. It seems like the, they only kind of pop out at like the big, big shows. Um, do you kind of see that becoming more of an online thing for chondro breeders? Well, yeah. And even at the big shows, like even Daytona now, you rarely see, you yeah. know, too many people with them down there. Um I think probably recently part of the issue might be paranoia over picking up something, you yeah, know, the whole yeah. night of scare, just everything that goes with it. Sure. Yeah. Um, I'm sure that that factors in for some of the people who are thinking about it. But the other thing is too, I think a lot of chondro breeders have the mindset, which is probably 99% accurate that people are going to gawk at what you have. They're not going to, you know, you're going to, you're not going to make a big dollar sale there to show like that. Yeah. Unless it's prearranged, um, right. which is why, like when in the mid '90s when we did the Condra Coalition, you know, like Rico would just, you know, he would just scoop it in because he had, I think, unlike all the other breeders there, he had a full range. He had high end stuff and introductory stuff. I guess mm-hmm. I want to say low range, but you know what I mean, like, yeah. you know, just yeah. just you know, um, the regular stuff, so to speak. But and that he sold, you know, a bunch of that kind of, you know, bunch of those kinds of chondros. Yeah. Whereas, you know, now I think he just, you know, and even then too, you had a lot of people that, you know, just wanted to get into the, you know, the higher, you know, the designers, the esoteric stuff. Yeah. I kind of feel like it's partly, it's going to sell online. So what's the, yeah, why get out of my pajamas? Why? I understand that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. If you're going to sell the majority yeah. of the clutch before it even hatches. I mean, I get know. that. I really do. Um, I, I, would you kind of like kind of want to almost like caution people when they're getting into chondros to not jump immediately for the high dollar value thing and try to find somebody a little bit 
lower on this totem while they're still learning? Because I, I, I've seen some people who were like, this is my second snake and it's a, a this, a this, a this. And I'm like, you, that's a $4,000 animal and you've had yeah. one corn snake. Like, yeah, I don't, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's tough because I know um, you got to sort of qualify how you explain that to someone because then they might find, you know, you go on Morph Market now, you can find brokers still, yeah. you know, brokering mm-hmm. stuff that's just coming in. And that's not a good first choice either. So, you know, it is tough to find, I guess, maybe in some ways, some breeders who have sort of the so-called introductory or things you, you maybe wouldn't you know, start off with, because that was an issue that came up in the 90s. You know, that's when a lot of these farm bred imports started, you know, just flooding in the market. And you had people like, you know, Bob Clark and several others who had these, you know, different localities and everything, which opened that whole door. Right. But they were selling them for like 250 bucks and totally just, you know, um, believe it or not, just, yeah, well, believe it or not, it just undercut the entire market. Yeah. And, even though you had Trooper and Eugene with the really cool designer stuff, and then they had their, you know, the babies that came from these designers, you still had people that looked at these, you know, Jayaporas and, and Beox and these other, you know, farm bred ones asking the question, well, why should I pay a thousand bucks for that when I get four of these for a thousand bucks? Right. Um, that, that's and that's happens. how much sweat. Yeah. Well, that's <laughs> yeah. still how much sway they had, you know? And, yeah. Unfortunately, a lot of those, I think, wound up dying because many of them weren't feeding. They didn't, you know, they couldn't tell you if they had a meal or not. And Yeah. I want to I want to hit on the Chondro Coalition. But before that, I wonder if what's your like with all your experience with Chondros, what would you say is the um, the thing that makes them difficult in people's eyes? That's like if because it seems like the people that nail it, nail it and they don't have any issues. Or maybe they're not sharing those issues, but it just seems like the people that are are nailing it are nailing it. Whereas, like what me and Owen were saying beforehand, it's like I, I keep I've kept all these different pythons and had no problems, and then yeah. all of a sudden this one yeah, is a problem. I, I, I stopped keeping chondros for the sake of the chondros. I don't want to I, do detriment to the species anymore. I, I chalk it up to <laughs> hy, hydri, hy, oh, I'm going to say hybridization. <laughs> Hydration is what I meant to say. I don't know. You have any thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, thoughts. I mean, obviously not uh, a lot of them perhaps un- unsubstantiated, but, um, uh, I don't know, we're trying to figure out where to start with this one. Mm. So, um, I would venture a guess that any of the big guys now, I mean, if you had a private conversation with, um, you know, Dave D or John Irby, They've got issues. Okay. There's not a there is not a single person. The, uh, well, I mean, I, and again, I'm saying this off the cuff and based on my own experience, but I, I think it would be, yeah, th- it just doesn't exist. Gotcha. You know, yeah. In my, okay. in my opinion, and right. it's not to say that any of these things are are um, you know indictments on the keeper at all. I mean, mm-hmm. it's just weird things. I mean, I, I never could figure out like you know the prolapse thing i mean some people will say hydration yeah. but i'm not sure i buy into that some would say food because we're feeding them pinkies and in the wild their normal diet as a hatchling is you know frogs and lizards which actually do pass much easier but um but then how do you explain all the other litters you have or you don't have any issues and then you you know like i have one ish i had one I had random little prolapses here and there but then I had one issue where, or one litter where I had four, five or six in the same litter, and I kept them exactly the same as I kept every other one. So I, I have no idea. And then you had the the cigar back thing that was going on. You know, I don't know if you're familiar with that, where the you know, the, the, the no. neos would would basically fold back onto themselves. Wow. You know, mm. and almost like depress their spine Fine. backwards, and they would snap out of it and seem fine. But if it was a repeated thing over time, what you would see when the animal got older, they would have sort of, I guess, these calcifications in those areas where that was occurring. Uh, And you'd get these little lumps. Um, You know, that was a, that was an issue. And of course, feeding is, is 
is well documented. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's really the prolapse issue and the and the and the cigar back thing that we've really sort of struggled, you know, um, just to figure yeah, out. I've, I've had, uh, I think I've had two of them that I've had prolapse with, um, but you know, I don't know. I, I've, I think I've had maybe twenty in my time and yeah. I, I don't know it's just weird like yeah you know with carpets i don't have no problems at all never a problem no, right no nothing and that's keep where them. i got to with them you know i looked at every all the other species of snakes that i keep and i'm like i don't have any problems with you i don't have any problems with you there's none of this with you guys none of mm-hmm. this with you guys and you know so it is it is it can be a frustrating thing um and the other thing is too i remember uh one of my best litters um I had back in, uh, what was it, 96, 97. Uh-huh. Um, best litters in terms of hatch rate uh, mm-hmm. for what I incubated myself. And I had several, a couple, well, a lot of really good animals. And I can't remember the bloodline that came from, but it was pretty valuable. Uh-huh. Rich Culver bought three of these babies from me. And they were at least six to eight months old. Mm-hmm. And I have one that just weird one day I'm checking on it and it's like half like sideways. And I'm like, wait a minute, something's not right. Next day, it's just dead. Right. And, you know, and this is way before NIDO, way before anything else. I mean, in fact, right. I was actually separated at the time. So my main collection was still at my old house. Right. These babies spent their entire time in this apartment bedroom that I set up to, to get them going. Okay. So there was no, in my view, very, very extremely low chance of any type of, you know, pathogenic cause mm-hmm. for it, in my view. Sure. Um, I mean, it was like a neurological thing. And this was an animal that was rolling. I mean, it just was, did miss a meal, didn't do anything. And that's why, you know, I had a few people back then that bought, you know, a snake and, you know, an issue would happen. And in some cases, I would just you know replace the animal because I've I've had that experience where just something unexplicable happens. Sure. Yeah. So yeah. That, that 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 comes up every once in a while where it's like we're not dealing with you know stamps or something. It, it, it's, yeah. it's a living animal. It, this stuff can happen, and and you can it can be out of the blue. And uh, I've said it multiple times where. Just because one clutch went this way doesn't mean the next year's clutch is going to go the same way, good or bad. I mean, right. it's just each one is different. Each season is different. So I can definitely see that being a, 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 a thing that happens like, around. Yeah, I feel like sometimes there's so much that we don't know <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> that, yeah. uh, you know. <laughs> that we well, some people we these days, you know, may have more, you know, to say about the prolapse issue and or the cigar back thing. I don't know. Sure. I, yeah. I don't really keep sure. up on all the all the you know the current things, but of what's going on? Gotcha. It's so weird with the whole back pedal thing, like oh, with the whole bending backwards. You think we would see the same thing in like a jaguar carpet python because they spend most of their life upside down when they're right. hatched up, like they're always going back. But I, I don't know. Maybe that's something we have not even thought about trying to observe in jags. They're already yeah. messed up as is. Let's add more. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> What is uh, so? Uh, let's sit on the Condro Coalition be- yep. for people that may not know what that is for new people. They do what, shame on them. They don't shame on them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, so I guess in the mid '90s, um, the idea was hatched. And I don't know who did it, but it was, you know, like Marshall Mendez and Trooper John Holland. Mm-hmm. Um, I was part of it a few times. Rico, um, it was probably Rico's idea, if I had to guess. Um, I think Greg Stevens was in it um, oh, yeah. at one point, um, uh, and I'm forgetting someone, uh, uh, Marshall. But um, is Terry Phillip in it? Uh, he, I think he dove in on on one of the later years because I can't remember. Like, because they always did. Um, I think he may have when they did the Tinley show one year. Okay, I didn't go. I've never been to Tinley. I've always wanted to go, but. It's always a month and a half into the school year, and it's just hard to dive away at that point. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. But um, but I believe Terry might have been part of one during the one of the Tinley shows that they did. 
So it's probably like uh, people would have heard us talk about carpet. Right? Well, I kind of remember, I don't know. I'm assuming it was maybe, I remember one Tinley I vended and I was splitting a table with Julie Bender. And uh, well, to your point, what you said earlier, we had, I had like, you know, these awesome carpet morphs and cutting edge stuff and nobody gave mm-hmm. a shit because they were gray looking snakes and <laughs> gray looking had babies. This yep. just normal, yeah. like, you know, green chondro and everybody's like, Oh my God, what is that? And they're freaking out, you know, and they want to see it and play with it and touch it. But they, you know. Yeah. I guess a lot of the carpet babies don't sell themselves really. No. Right? You got to bring in, a, you, <laughs> if, they, if they're not old enough, you got to bring an adult. You got to bring mom and sit her. This in will thing. turn into that. Yeah, that I can yeah. guarantee you, right? I have this, this is mine, but, so Get we had yeah. we had carpet row on the one side. It was it was me and Julie and I believe it was Balin and Nate Howard and maybe oh, I'm trying to think about Luke. Luke Snell, Luke Snell. was there yep. as well. Yep. There's a couple other people that I'm probably forgetting, but I remember to the left of us was uh Terry Phillip and Marshall Mendez. I can't remember if Rico was there or not. Clockwork. I want to say he was. was. Maybe. Yeah. But, uh, you know, they had all these Contras. And I remember they had one of those, you know, blue with the black look. I guess back then they called it white face. I don't know what it's called now. But um, it was like $10,000. And I'm like, holy shit, that's a nice snake. Jeez. You know? Wow. But, yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, so did you keep the clutch back when you the first one you produced? Or you didn't even know that you were going to get yeah, I had no idea. I mean, I was just thrilled that I, you know, produced Got babies. Them. Yeah, yeah, produced babies, right? And um, and that was a maternal litter. Nice. My first few were maternal because I didn't have a fancy incubator to um, hatch them out in. And at the time, you know, you talk to Trooper and Eugene; they're using Forma Scientific, yeah, you no know, incubators. And um, the closest I had to that was one of those Hova baiters. And I thought, well, this isn't going to cut it, so the female's going to have to do the work, which actually turned out in hindsight to be one of the most fulfilling or, you know, fulfilling things I ever did because just to watch so the natural process, yeah, you know, I thought was really cool, and um, you know, so so that was that was that was really a lot of fun. Um, I actually do have a picture of a, a local show that. Uh, Sean, me, buddy, the chamois had done. Mm, okay. And um and I actually had well what turned into Mr. Blue on the table for sale <laughs> for for a thousand bucks. Which at the time was outlandish because that's that was right at the peak of the import wave. Okay. So I mean the the prices have really the prices really became depressed at the time. Um so I mean, looking back, you're you're glad he didn't sell, right? I mean, oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there were a lot of cool snakes out of that litter. Actually, I didn't. Yeah. But I mean, I had no idea. I mean, you looked at, I mean, the the legend man. He was he was nice. I mean, he was kind of that bluish black with the sort of bluish triangles under the right lighting, and mm-hmm. you know the and the female powder. You know, the powder sib female. She was green. I mean, she wasn't. You know, she wasn't, I mean, the so-called the blue female, she wasn't blue to start. I mean, she was green and turned blue over, you know, successive litters. Right. Nothing out of the ordinary is what it, and then, oh. and then him. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so. Cool. Um, I was going to say, like, real quick, what was your setup like for maternal incubation? Like, how did you, how did you set that up? Yeah. I've so, done carpets, but <laughs> yeah. So I had the um, if you remember, like the two by two uh, Neodache arboreal cages. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I had that was my arboreal setup. I was using the um, like the seventy five watt um, Zoomed infrared lamps. Sure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. This was probably predating heat panels, which I'm still not a huge fan of, honestly. I. I if I had my druthers, I would always do the heat lamps. I just feel like they do, they have a better focal point for the heat mm-hmm. where I think some heat panels, just because of their size, it's too much. But again, I mean, people are successful with them. I just, maybe it's just something I grew up with that I was more comfortable with. Anyway, so I had that sort of set up off to the side as much as I could, because if you remember, they sort of put that circular vent right dead yeah. center. 
Yeah. So I kind of scooted it off as far as I could. And I had one of these rubber made rough totes on like, say the one side of the cage, say the right side. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And so there was dry sphagnum in there, a few holes cut out for her to get into. And then on the entire floor of the cage was probably two or three inches of like just soaking wet sphagnum moss. Right. And then I had a heat pad underneath that same side, the side opposite the, the, the nest box. Okay. And the purpose for that was to kind of keep, keep the humidity up, I guess, to, you know, mm -hmm. drive the humidity. Right. So that was the basic setup really. Um, you know, Trooper just told me, just don't let the temperatures get too warm. Let the female do the work. Gotcha. You, yeah. you can easily overheat the eggs, but the female will make up the difference if it's a little too cool. So, you know, I tried to, you know, keep that in mind. Did you ever leave the eggs when you were? Doing no, it? never. No. Mm -mm. Stayed on. She was awesome. I mean, she had her first, was it two or three litters? She had six litters total, which is crazy. Right. Because hmm. you really hear it. And her first litter was at two and a half years old. Wow. Oh, shit. Okay. I mean, I still, yeah, I still have her data card. Now, and I haven't heard of any other female sort of, maybe Trooper may have had some, but um, now keep in mind, I got this female um, nearly a year and a half old mm -hmm. from Trooper. Okay. So at that time, this year and a half old was eating small slash medium rats oh, jesus <laughs> oh he, he was a heavy feeder um yeah he was a heavy feeder but again she you know she produced a litter of 24 there was 24 eggs 17 live babies in that first litter two and a half years old that is not Mater maternal for a first litter. and then the next year i i bred her again maternal oh, i mean i you know this was partly just ignorance on my part right, right. but she was fine and then i did give her a year off Mm -hmm. And then bred her. That's when Mr. Blue turned into Mr. Blue. I sold it to John Holland. Then we bred him back to the to the to mom two right. straight years. So, and I think one of those was maternal and one of those was artificial. Wow. Was the thinking back then that the blue when you started to see the chondro turn blue? Did you did you uh, did you think of it as a morph? Was it like yeah, well, uh, what, what, was, kind of what was the thought process? Because I guess ball pythons were sort of kicking in at that point. And yeah, I mean, there were so many different like animals of origin. I mean, you had mentioned in the text you sent me about the sort of the the way they've divided up the condors these days. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, mm -hmm. like like um, you know, uh, genetically speaking. Sure. And you know, there was so much mix mash going in there. Um, right. I always felt because of the horm, I always felt, you know, that the genetics sort of supplied the parameters that you could pretty much expect. Right. Right. But then again, I mean, there's always mixing and other miscellaneous things that happen, um, which actually makes them really attractive because you end up in some cases with an entire litter full of unique animals sure. in, right. in, in, in all their different ways. And, um, but genetically, I don't know that it ever could be sort of pinned down just because I feel like the hormones play such a part yeah. on, you know, sort of what happens with the colors. I don't know. Have you noticed that the females would, because it's the females that would be hormonal blue, is it? Is it something that they would not, it would not happen until like they ovulated or was it like as they matured that they would change or what? What was your experience? Yeah, if I look back on the pictures of my own the original female, she was like a she was green mm -hmm. when we when my brother the first year sitting on the eggs coming off the eggs, she was more like a blue green sort of you know she was in right. transition, and then after that second litter is when she really hit the you know pretty much was blue I guess. Yeah, I, I think this would. So it was like a progression once is that he had a blue animal that would always go back to green until like one clutch and just like stayed, stayed blue. blue and that yep. was it yeah yeah because she kind of drifted more green after that first litter and then um i mean the blue was definitely there but not as prominent hmm. has there been any thought to why chondros do that and other snakes don't yeah that is interesting i never yeah. I never gave that much thought hmm yeah. I mean, I guess it's just the interplay of the hormones that are going along with the reproductive process that also, are, I guess, are playing a role with 
the the colors. I don't know. I mean, I mean, we have other species that kind of color because I know people will say that rough scale pythons will color up into like that silvery kind of look that they get, but nothing that like you don't have a roughy that turns silver and stays silver. Like it's right. not. Yeah. Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> not, yet. <laughs> not yet. Good point. I. I will Silver start. line ruffies I, oh, coming your yeah. way. <laughs> yeah. Yes, my babies. Don't worry. Yeah, uh, yeah I just I'll was always curious about that. It's sort of like the same thing. It's like, why are some, you know, in particular with Moralia, why are some red? Mm. You know, you'll have some chondros that are red and some are yellow and you'll have some that are all yellow. You have some carpets that are hatch out red and then they, you know, and some that don't. Well, they, yeah. I always... You know, it's one of those things I, I guess we'll never know the answer to, but uh, it's fun to think about, at least for me. No, it is, and 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 Owen, before I forget about this, so you're you're working with the um, the rough scales. Oh yeah, that, yeah. That's what that's all this rack right here is. This. Oh, this that's incredible. Kid. And then back there is mom, dad, and an older brother. So yeah. So now, so now, how prevalent are they now? Like in terms of the captive stock, it's weird because it seemed like. A couple of years ago, they they were on the cusp of being freaking everywhere, and right. I guess several people have hit problems. Um, you know, this is what happens: is that so? Cameron had a bunch of them, and he sold out all of his, and they spread around with a bunch of people. And some people had success. More people ended up buying pairs and then losing one or losing both. So. It, we're kind of coming back down to it where it seems like there was going to be a big balloon and now we're kind of shrinking back down where people who may have produced a clutch now lost their adults. And so they're out there, but, and there is some interest and people are out there seeking like a female or a male because they already have uh, one or the other, but then certain people who are interested in them because they've been a, a Contra person or, or a Morelia person. They're asking about uh, pairs, but they seem to kind of keep holding true at their price of like anywhere between like 12 to 15, which they've nice. had for a couple years now, which is which is odd because you see other animals like olive pythons where they breed and they don't have any more for mutation either. And their price went from like up here to like down further into the yeah. hundreds, five, four hundred. So well, that's probably supply and demand, right? That is true. There's also a rough scale python that has like 16, 20 eggs max and, and an olive python that if you do it wrong, will will ditch 30 on you. So, yeah, it's... My mm. thought on the rough scale python, you tell me if you agree, Owen, but like, yep. uh, it's like, I think it was one of those things that it was just the idea of it and everybody was excited about the idea of it and then yep. they got it and then maybe it wasn't like what they thought it would be. And then the people that are just really into having rough like understood what what it what is they have you know what I, I mean? mean like this is a rare python and there's there's that there's that part of it definitely and then there's the the other part of it like um if you buy a frill lizard because you expect it to frill at you all the time you're going to be disappointed <laughs> if yeah. you buy a rough scale python because you want to see that threat display i have seen it once out of all the rough scale pythons <laughs> i have ever had once so wow yeah but so no, what's I, what? I, so what's your group consist of? Uh, I have a reverse trio of adults. I oh, know I have a trio of adults. Duh. I have one male, two female of adults, and then I have a male juvie, and then all these are mine. Nobody can have them. It's like no, these are the babies from last year. Um, uh, I'm keeping a pair, maybe a trio, and then that those two have to go to Eric. I'm, I'm not allowed to look at them anymore. So, <laughs> um, Eric already has those, yes. but. Um, well, that's cool. Well, congratulations. Is that your first litter or, uh, I had two clutches last year from two girls. So, wow. Good for yeah. you. That's awesome. Oh yeah. In the yeah. deep end. It was right. In, like, I mean, like, we're not gonna, <laughs> I have this much time to figure out the first clutch cause the next one is coming on its heels. So yeah, it was, but I, I love them. They're, they're my favorite. They're my favorite species of snake. Were and, they yeah. similar, more similar to carpets to get going or more so similar to green trees? Chondros? I, I set up expecting chondros and I got carpets like I was getting ready to some of them did have to get started on birds, which again, and, and I did want to kind of talk about that with you is like 
being where I'm at now with this with these clutches, I had access to so many things to right. try with them. Yeah. Things like button quail babies and um, even breeders that are supplying eggs of quail that had fully matured but had not hatched. So I could crack it open and have a bird the size of a fuzzy to offer to these guys. It's mm-hmm. like you guys back then, like were, were you scouring various farmlands <laughs> to see if you could find some chicken guy that was going <laughs> to give you stuff? Like how did you get the shit that you could, I know African softwares were supposed to be like the, the godsend for several things. So and there was no know. internet. Exactly. <laughs> you know, yeah, it's not like yeah. you could just, you know, well, I think back then, um, you went with typical things, so you could get chicks. Yeah. I mean, a lot of the a lot of the um, purveyors of rodents sold chicks. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you you we tried. Um, I remember when Pete Call um, hatched out a litter, and he couldn't get it going. He had um, either Crutchfield or Strictly sending up send him up a box full of these hylid tree frogs, and so we wound up pureeing some of them as they were, you know, dying off and, um, you know, like geckos, things of that, like house geckos, you know? Mm -hmm, Um, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, that, that was, it wasn't too much. I mean, the only thing that really worked for me personally was, um, was like the chick feathers. Like I would rip off the scruff Mm -hmm. if really fine feathers on the, on the uh, neck. And, you know, after you thaw pinky and water you know you just stick it on the head and i had had a lot of luck with that as a matter of fact uh troopers go to was he would bring a a chick home from the zoo a live one cut it fresh you know kill it fresh Mm -hmm. open up the guts put the pinkies right in the blood and guts i tried that it didn't work for me but um i tried geckos i tried well the frogs actually worked a little bit um Mm -hmm. But it was funny. Some frogs didn't because I know, um, you know, I think I pureed up one of Sean's dead um, poison arrow frogs. Mm-hmm, right. And it just didn't, didn't elicit work. the same response. Yeah. It, it's mm-hmm. funny because I have right here a bag of quail feathers and mm-hmm. I would drop the wet <laughs> pinky in and then you shake and bake. You just kind of do yep. this and then you throw it at them. And uh, I haven't had to use it in a while, but it's over there. So yeah. um, it, it's funny, those kinds of tricks and, you know, how you kind of evolve with that stuff, because I have certain other species that are totally into frog feeders right off the bat. And I, I get frog legs routinely and mm-hmm. fall out the pinkies with that stuff and it works. So everything this old becomes new again. So, That's right. That's yeah. right. <laughs> and, you know, and some of them with the condors, too, came down to technique, mm-hmm. you know, learning the technique, refining it. Um, and again, it, it, it certainly helped me out a lot to have, you know, troopers here back then too, because he was, um, you know, pretty adamant and impressing upon me that sometimes you just have to really piss them off. Yeah. Yeah. You, know, you really do. Where you're looking at this little thing and you're thinking, man, it's delicate. You don't want to hurt it. And this, that, and the other. And he pretty much, you know, strike that whole notion out of my mind. I'm Make curious. it mad. Yeah. I'm curious if you had similar results like I found with picky carpets. There's like if you hit them like right behind the neck, they yes. sort of like turn. The magic yep. button. Yep. Yeah, yep. it would work with contrast too. Okay. Yeah. That's, yep. that's good to know. Yeah. Yeah, that became a that that became something that you know that that we made pretty you know pretty good use of. I mean, you just tap them right on the side of the ass there and mm-hmm. you know, yeah. they just kind of swing around with their mouth open. <laughs> then it, once it's engaged it's like uh, right in there yeah. well i don't know man you, you talk to some condor people and they'll tell you how many condors they've had in their life that would bite rap like a, a drop. bite oh, rap like a bite rap like a i and love so, how you have those in your collection that you know those are the ones who are going to bite rap and let go so when you go away and you feed everybody and then you leave and you can smell it you know which cages you should go to first because these are the ones who drop things or right. grab it and put it behind their hide box, which is just lovely. So, yep. Yeah. I'd be back then I would take, um, you know, like a half dozen of mm. these shoe boxes 
and line them up and I would just work my way down. So the ones that dropped, I would just give them a little time to get themselves resettled and Mm -hmm. move on down the line. And the same thing with the so-called runners, you know, the ones you try to tease feed a little bit and they just start moving all over the place. Just put the lid on and move on and they'll get themselves back together. But um, they can be frustrating. I remember sometimes not even wanting to go in the reptile room just because I knew it. I knew what I had to face and I just didn't want to face it. You know? So, yeah. Yeah. Were you keeping Jess Condros then or did you have other stuff? I had a few other things. Yeah. I mean, so I had um, still the Emerald Tree Boa, um, the Brazilian Rainbow. I don't remember what else I had back then. I think I had a pair of the bearded dragons, a pair of um, blue tongue skinks. Oh, okay. Yeah. And then it more from there. I mean, now I've got probably, I don't know, like 24 different species of things. Oh, shit. Okay. Well, I mean, it's not a huge collection, but it's, you know, probably 60 or 70 animals. So I don't have a lot of individuals of any one species, but. Is it pythons and boas or is it pythons, boas? Oh, God, it's, a, it's, it's all everything. kinds of things. I, I got okay. toward it. I got tortoises now too, man. It's just, it's, it's yeah. just gone. It's gone everywhere. Yep. Excellent. Yeah. So nice, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's a smattering of different things. Um, it's funny too, because you were talking about things coming full circle. I mean, some of these yep. things were things I had back in the nineties and because I got so, um, you know, into the condros, it, it sort of started eating into the time I could allocate to other things. Mm-hmm. So I had, you know, a really nice pair of Arizona mountain Kings. I sold oh. those. So I got another pair of them now. And, <laughs> you know, um, yeah. you know, I had some house snakes back in the day. And so I got back into those. And oh, so cool. just, to, yeah. yeah. And I actually picked up this past summer. I'm really excited about it. Um, the Aurora house snakes, which I'd never had wow. always wanted. Cool. So I've got a, um, well, supposed to be a, I suppose I have a trio. I bought a pair from Europe, uh-huh. which, by the way, getting stuff from Europe nowadays, oh, my God, it's so, so easy. <laughs> I had no idea, man. So, you know, last summer when I got out of school, you guys remember Jurgen? Yeah. From yes. the Netherlands, okay? Yeah. So we stay in touch. We're still friends. He doesn't really keep anything. Um, so I reached out to him, and I'm like, hey, man, I know you still keep a pulse on what's going on out there, and I know Europe is a place where you can – get things we can't get here necessarily. Sure. And there are a couple of people working with them here, but nobody had anything available. I said, put your ears open to finding these snakes. He had no idea what the hell they were. So within a month, this was like in May. So within probably less than a month, he tracked down um, a male uh-huh. from a guy in the Netherlands who was selling it because apparently it's not legal to feed live animals uh-huh. there. Okay. And this thing was only eating live. So I actually got it for a really good deal. And so then he found this female, which was a holdback female. This guy in Italy was selling, met the guy in, in ham show, bought that animal for me, then took both animals to this, um, was it called? Um, Dutch dragons. Okay. You know, okay. you know, they are, I think it's yeah, called uh-huh. Dutch dragons. Okay. They're they're like a shipper, right? So he he takes these two snakes to them, mm-hmm. and the next week I've got them. It, no 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 nuts. no sighties, no nothing, yep. and it right. only cost me and it cost me two hundred and fifty dollars door to door, which is crazy. <laughs> so nuts. apparently what apparently what goes down is somehow these guys are able to I guess get blanket sighties things or whatever mm-hmm. uh-huh. they shipped it then to this guy the sun Fla- the sunfire dragon ranch in California yeah Bob okay. Mayu, he just passed away yep. okay but so what happened was my shipment from Europe got sent there I assume with other animals right and then they then split it and then FedEx it to, to each individual person right. because when I got the FedEx shipment that's the address that was on there was, was on it someplace yeah. in California. And so, um, and it said Sunfire. Sunfire. Well, mm-hmm. I, th- I don't know if it was still called the Dragon Ranch or not, but in either case, but yeah. So within like a month and a half of me telling Jurgen this is what I want, <laughs> they're in my hands. What I'm thinking initially is going to be like a year. Right. Mm-hmm. You know, we'll get these things by the time we get the paperwork, the health certificates, all that 
crazy yep. crap, it's going to be a year, right? So, yeah, and 250 door to door. It is, and it's so much easier to now get the. I, I've had several animals get shipped to Canada. You know, you got to send them through um, one of the shipping companies that does that now, and they you ship it to them, they hang on to it, and then they ship it to Canada. I, it was it took a week for the animals to go from and my I, place to there. Yep. And I assume it's all in the up and up, right? I mean, oh, yeah. I don't know. I yeah. mean, I guess. No, yeah, it has. It's all legal. They have all the CITES. They do all the paperwork. That's why it took a week. You know, it was at the first place within 24 hours. And then it left the following week because they had to get all the clearances and stuff like that. And then it was gone. And then yeah. next, the, the, the following, it left my house on Monday, arrived on Tuesday. The following Tuesday, it was landing in Canada with its owner. Wow. Um, that was it. Not yeah, yeah, so I, I had no I had no idea. I mean, because the last thing I shipped was over to Europe, required all the advanced paperwork, you yeah. know, all the CITES stuff and health certificate, meeting with fish and wildlife, the, the whole nine yards. But um yeah, that was an amazing experience. Yeah, that's awesome. That's cool. And so the, the, yeah, that's that's awesome. They're such a cool snake, house snakes. They kind of have like a python head almost, like look to them. They well know. what's weird about it is you know, the the house snake is the house snakes are like a complex. Uh -huh. They actually constitute about four different genuses. Oh, really? I didn't know that. Like the Aurora like the Aurora house snake is not the same genus as the brown or the black house snake. Oh, okay. And they're different looking animals too. Really? One of them, like the, the the brown and black house snakes, you know, sort of have the elliptical eyes, different features, different mm -hmm. scalation. The auroras have round eyes. I mean, they're completely different. I just, I assume that the whole house snake thing is like a moniker, like rat snake, for example. Gotcha. Right. Okay. You know, a rat snake is is a variety of different, right? You know, species, and so. Well, that's cool. Yeah. Awesome. That's cool. What else do you got cooking over there? What else? Is so, there? yeah, so some some house snakes, and I a couple of years ago um, got the hankling to get into some rosy boas. Mm, okay. So there's this guy. Um, his name's Ryan Shadow. He's out in California. Okay. Called Baja Boas, an amazing, yeah, amazing collection. And his website is awesome. It's non-commercial, really. I mean, it's a commercial website, but it's really like non-glittery. Mm -hmm. And it has all these different localities of these different or these, you know, different localities of rosies. And so it's really a cool, you know, experience. I'm more of a, you know, kind of a wild type person as opposed to, you know, like a morph guy. Like I think I've maybe only have, you know, five animals. If, no, not even that. Probably three mm -hmm. that are like morphs of some sort. Um, but anyway, so I got into some of those. Um, the thing that sort of took you know, stole my heart from the condors was the annulated boas. Uh, back <laughs> yes. in 2017, <laughs> I bred those and then bred them again in 2019. So um, I'm raising up, a, you know, a small group of those. Um, okay. My adults now are, my female now, I think she's, she's peaked. Uh, she's just not, she's not leading me to believe that she's capable okay. of like doing another litter. Gotcha. You know, like her feedings become more erratic or, mm -hmm. right. you know, and she is 20 years old now. So, yeah. Wow. Yeah. So I got, you know, you know, I got um, a male and two females that I'm raising up that were born in 2017. So they should be ready probably next year. Very cool. But they're a lot of fun. I enjoy those. Not as much color variation, but super neat animals. Yeah, I gotta watch it. I, I'm on the show. <laughs> yeah, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta chill because I have, um, I got a pair of Argentines, and I keep looking at um, Hog Island boas and stuff like that. Oh yeah, yeah. I only have so much space in my house. <laughs> like I gotta, yeah. gotta chill. So the boa rumor is almost coming true. I went almost, yeah. <laughs> almost. But. Those Argentines, though. Are it, so I can't remember. Did Keith have pink on them? Like some of the ones I do. I mean, yeah. they, but I like the high black ones anyway. So yeah. oh, okay. Yeah. I went for I went for the least. He, he Keith kept pointing out like the high pink, and I'm like, no, nah, I want that one. I want that. Uh, get in. Yeah. Uh, but okay. it's so how old, their own. how old are your Argentines? Oh, they're babies. They're okay. About, almost a year old at this point. Oh, okay. 
but yeah. they're hissy and angry and upset all the time. Love them. Love them to death. Yeah. Yeah. I like those ones that try to kill me. No, I love those, man. In fact, <laughs> I picked one up. Um, I picked a mail up from a buddy of mine. Um, not this past fall, the one before. Mm. Um, only because it was one of the first super cool, unique boas that, you know, I held at Pete's because I actually wound up volunteering at Pete Calls for a period of time mm-hmm. back okay. in the early 90s, too. And um, that was an awesome experience, too, talking about being in the right place at the right time. I was lucky enough to see the first albinos born that he had. Wow. And geez. also the first piebalds because um, he was the first one to kind of prove all that out. Yeah. Sure. Um, but he also had Argentines. And so I've always wanted one to have. And I'm sure I could be talked into getting a female at some point. <laughs> Not a lot of um, arm, arm twisting. Yeah. But, you know, it's, it's, you know, coming back again to this full circle thing, you know, mm-hmm. they were really popular back in the nineties and early two thousands. Then you didn't see them for a while. Now yeah. you're seeing them and these really crazy high pink ones and everything. You know, it's how, funny how the animals, some of these animals sort of cycle through like a ebb yeah. and flow. Dumerals, the bow is the same thing. Yes. Yeah. You can yes. find them everywhere in the 90s and early 2000s. Then they sort of disappeared for a while. And now they're yeah. back. Now, that, more, now they're... they're much more expensive, I might add. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's the thing where it's like I I never seem to get them when they're on that on the in the valley. It's when Yeah, they were 350 back then. Now they're like 600, 800 dollars yeah. and same thing with the Argentines. They're like yes. over a grand now. Yeah. They well, were 400 bucks back in the 90s. Yeah, ring pythons. Like they apparently they were giving them away at Hamburg shows, and yeah. like and I, I did not pay that for I I yeah so yeah it seems like goes when away I was, and then comes back. Yeah, when I was a when I was a kid in reptiles in the eighties, it was kind of like it was all about species, and then the morph thing came in, and then it became about you know that about one species, you know, or a couple of species, I would say, and then it seems like it's sort of going back to that multi-species type of thing yeah more fun yeah. with the multi-species stuff yeah yeah i mean yeah i don't know just animals would, with different habits and things like that you know just yeah different I, things I, to pick your interest i got bored opening up every cage and bin seeing a carpet python with a different color pattern like yeah. I, you know i i, I wanted and now i have You've what taken it too far, Owen. I did. I yeah. did. No, don't, don't follow me. You're like it is not. It's not a good place where I am. Yeah, it's uh, the jungle over here. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Quite. Well, and, you know, and honestly, if there were things I would get into as far as like Morris are concerned, would definitely be the carpets. I mean, there's some really yeah. wicked cool things out there. Yeah. I mean. What's the problem? Is I say I don't want to do it, but then I'm like, I love a good tiger carpet, and yeah, it's. Yeah, like some of the stuff they're doing in Australia is just like yeah, holy shit, yeah. Man, you know, yep. I was looking at some hypo, uh, super hypos today, and I'm like, my god, I'm like, There's, oh, I have the ingredients uh, for that over here. Justin <laughs> Smythe designer carpet yes, pythons in Australia. Yeah, he has yeah, like yeah. that hypo that has yeah. like one tiny black scale on it, and other if than that, that it's that like were orange me, and lighter orange. <laughs> If that were me, I would look at that one black scale and I'd be like, you son of a bitch. Like, you would you color know, it in my... with a marker, wouldn't you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> get, off, get off my snake. Yeah. I'll get you. What's God. it like? Uh, what's your What's your feeling on having such a impact on Chondro history? Like, Do you think about that? Does it, do Not really. I mean, I'm kind of... About it? I mean, yeah. I mean, I've done, yeah. you know, some podcasts or whatever. I guess really I'm just humbled by it, to be honest, because... I mean, there was nothing in the, there was no blueprint or game plan I had. I, I, they were the only they were the only two animals or the only two green trees I had at the time when right. I produced Mr. Blue. Right. So um, I just happened to be fortunate enough to live not too far from a guy who had been, you know, I mean, I've more or less benefited from Trooper and Eugene's 20 plus years of work. Right. And, and you know, Swatak and all the others who contributed to that bloodline and um so I, I, I more or less just consider myself again almost like you know being affiliated with Pete call just being in the right place at the right time i mean so looking at some of the conjures that are being produced today you know things come to mind like uh <laughs> sickness and a couple of other lines and things like that 
ever want to like just start dipping your toe back into that craziness or you're like that 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 time has passed and we're good now well i i think it'd be hard for anyone not to look at some of those animals and say wow i'd like to have one or two of those Mm -hmm. you know like the stuff budway's producing and um you know and jimmy optal and, and my nephew christian and i mean you know john irby dave d i mean all those guys you look at some of their yeah. top end animals and it, and and it's like your jaw just drops mm-hmm. and it's not yeah. like they have one of them i mean they've got an <laughs> army of these things yeah. Yeah. and it's just like wow you know and um and i've been in awe about it and i i, I there's a part of me that feels like I got out the right time because <laughs> I probably would have gotten run over by these guys, you know? And so, you know, I had my little piece and moved on, you know, where these right. guys are really just, I mean, taking the next level, you know? Yeah. Some of the stuff that's getting produced today is just crazy. But, you know, we started seeing some of the glimpses of it because, uh, you know, after Mr. Blue was hatched out, you know, Buddy Getzker and I did a couple of nice pairings with um, my blue female and his so-called daddy pants, which was a pretty unique animal that came from the old yeller line. And okay. we produced some phenomenal animals out of that litters. Or out of that well, we had one main litter. We had the other one was only a couple of babies. Um, but there were a lot of smoking animals that came out of there. I love the names and the lines, because then it's like some people have to like do it and say it. <laughs> it's like, yes, this is a daddy pants animal. It's like, I thought, yes. I got to tell you, man, that's my favorite thing about the content community <laughs> is that they name them, you know? Yeah. It's yeah. Like, I wish that the carpet people did that more. But like, I don't know. It just becomes such an iconic animal that especially right. if it's a nice animal, you know? Right. It's like yeah. everybody remember. Oh, I know that one. Oh, I know that one. Yeah. yeah. Like, uh, yeah, and I think one? Greg probably took that to the next level. I mean, I think Trooper named some. Um, I never named any of mine. I, I don't even know where the legend name came for the male, the sire to Mr. Blue. Um, I think John Holland gave Mr. Blue Mr. Blue's name, right? Um, Trooper had some names, yeah, like Old Yeller and Powder, yeah. Um, did you ever mess with yellow chondros, like high yellow? I did. You know, when you guys were before I hopped in, you were talking about yeah. the um, the yellows, the the um, lemon trees, the cofio. Yeah. Well, they had the the canaries, and then they had the the lemon trees were before. That was like Tim Tremisi. Yep. Way yep. back, um, way back when. Mm-hmm. Um, but then they had those canaries. I did get a pair of canaries once, and I don't remember what I did with them. <laughs> I never bred them, and I think they did turn yellow. Oh, they think one of them stayed yellow; the other one turned green. Okay, um, but yeah, I don't remember what I did with them. I think I hear that they're notoriously difficult to get established as far as babies. At least that's what I've heard. That- I- yeah, I don't. Yeah, I can't remember. Hmm. Has there ever been that one that you thought was going to be stellar, and then it just turned green? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yep. All right. I had one of um, if I if I remember, you guys send me an email. I'll send you a picture of this one that was probably one of the most bizarre looking babies I ever produced, and I thought for sure, man, this is going to be something. And it was just as plain one of the plainest green snakes, you know. <laughs> yeah, that's that's my fear. <laughs> so I'd get into yeah. counters and be like, this one, this one, damn it! <laughs> like, and then it's like. I, so yeah, yeah, we were sort of talking about this with jungle carpets. Uh, I think it was the last episode when we were talking to Ben, but we were sort of saying about like back in the day, it was sort of like hit or miss. Like you would get maybe like two or three in the clutch that would be like that neon yellow and high black, and then the other ones would be okay. But anymore, it's just like they're all mm-hmm. you know, like you'll get like maybe one that's eh, it's got a couple black spots, or whatever. But like yeah, you know. I mean, the good thing about that, though, is, you know, you have the genetics. Mm -hmm. And I remember, you know, Paul Miles, uh, who was used to be partners with Pete at the Boa Barn. Um, He he did some of the albino stuff as as well. But he had a pair of um, Amazon Basin Emeralds and, you know, very early on and bred them. And they had, I mean, weak striping as far as basins go. Right. But that that one actually that pair produced 
Uh, I think one of the first like sort of snowflake or whatever they call the oh, crazy cool. white ones. Yeah. And right. I think, and I think it might, if I'm not mistaken, I'm, I, I could be wrong on this, but I think that animal that Paul produced went to Ed Marino and became one of the sort of founders of that particular line. Again, I can't remember, um, but I know Paul produced it. Um, so, um, yeah, but I, again, it came from two animals that were, you know, not the most right. well-striped animals. Right. Right. And I know like even in the old, old yeller litter, um, there were several awesome animals in that litter and the female was a wild caught biot and she was just green, really right. a very dark green, but just green, right. a very nondescript, you know, animal. Hmm. Okay. Cool. Yeah. I, uh, I think of, um, what's that? Con I think he's over somewhere in maybe Portugal mosaic that crazy looking condor. Oh, yeah. The mosaic condors that we get it from. Yeah. I see. They have a lot of different colors. It looks like somebody threw fruity pebbles at a snake. Yeah. Guess, yeah. yeah. Like the computer condro back in the day is maybe. Yeah. It's not, yeah, probably similar to that. Yeah, yeah. It, there's a lot of different kind of um, stuff out there, and I, and I know everybody at one point, if they had an animal that didn't kind of match what other people were producing, they slapped a name on it and tried to turn it into something. I know that kind of happened in the early 2000s. That happened a lot in carpet mm -hmm. pythons, where this thing came out, and I'm going to call it this, and then they never got to the point where it either they they couldn't confirm it so like something mm -hmm. weird would come out they name it call it a morph and then either they bred it and none of the babies lined up or they it never got to that point and it just kind of fizzled out so i wouldn't be surprised if a lot of stuff has changed that's yeah there's mosaic. one yeah yeah that's the mosaic nice wow yeah very cool um okay I didn't know that that that's an article. Okay. Um, do you think that, uh, uh, let's see, what else do we have to hit on? I, you know, I, sometimes I think, you know, you see this with carpet pythons too, but like I, I kind of have a theory that sometimes you see these crazy, you know, looks and stuff because of somewhat of crossing two species or subspecies or stuff like that. And, I don't know. I kind of like I, I kind of like how the Condra world does it, uh, where they sort of designate it as designer, mm -hmm. um, and they sort of. It's so weird how different it is from carpet python world, where it's like they'll fight you because you know you're. Gone. How dare you try to? <laughs> don't, how dare you? Yeah, <laughs> you know, uh, but it seems like. The like Condra world is just sort of like, you know, it's like, it's a cool snake, you know, you keep it in a box. What difference does it make? It looks beautiful. Right. Yeah. It's cool to look at. Has that sort of been your thoughts of, of, of things or? Yeah, I guess so. I mean, natural type of look? well, no, but with the Condros, obviously with the, the, the designer thing seemed to blossom around the same time that I got into it. Right. I know that the uh, trooper used to refer to his animals as mutts. Right. Oh, you yeah. know, just because. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, because they were the first, he and Eugene and such were the first to establish these sort of genealogies for their animals. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So they knew where the founders came from. And, you know, like, for example, they had, you know, like these Biox from the Philly Zoo and, you right. know, Carl Switek's animal that came in, captured Gravid, you know, that was in the Reptiles magazine. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so... You know, so there were just a bunch of ones, but at that point, I, you know, no one or they didn't know that they were, you know, that distinct, I guess, to be kept different or separate, right. you know, but I, sure. yeah, I mean, and I think part of that was just because when animals came over here, unless you were Carl Swatak and went over and got it, right, you had no idea where they were coming out of, right, you know, and I remember you know, my own mind being blown when, you know, the Marukis became the big thing. Mm -hmm. And then I'm talking to Cameron Spedal and he goes, 
Dude, you know, the funny thing is, there is no such thing as a Maruki Chondro. <laughs> Maruki is just a port they're getting shipped out of. Oh, that's Jesus, what's on the box. Yeah. yeah, that's it, right? So <laughs> he said it's down in the southern part of the, you know, the, the island there. And, um, you know, there's not no rainforest down there. So, yeah. I'm like, well, why do they call them that? He goes, well, that's just where they get shipped out of. Yeah, uh, there was a there's a line of carpet python that I had that was high contrast Queensland because that's what was on the box. Yeah. High contrast Queensland. So yeah. wow, that's it. That's happened a lot. Atherton, yeah. Atherton, Atherton carpet. You know. Yep. Um, so now quick. speaking of carpets, I got one question for you guys because you're yep. the, you're the, car- the carpet expert. So I do actually have a pair of. Um, I don't, did you guys come down to the ICAS way back in 2013? Oh, yeah, I got the shirt hanging up in the thing. Ah, yeah. good deal. Yeah. And, of oh, course, yeah. you know, John Romano had was charged with sprucing up a video to come out of that, which never happened. But um, so anyways, you know, I that that's when I bought the um, – I think Nick was there, and yep. I bought the complete carpet python, which I think had just come out around yep. that time. Yep, yep. So then he signed it, and I was like, well, I guess if I bought the book, I, I got to buy the animals. And they had a small <laughs> little thing there. And the guy, Ryan, from Clockwork Reptiles, I think, had some yeah. eerie and giant carpets, which I believe came from Cameron. Yep. yep. Um, yep. So I actually raised them up as a pair and I bred them a couple nice. of years ago. Um, yeah, really cool animals, actually. Um, but what do they call them these days? Or is it New Guinea? <laughs> Carpets now, it's, uh, you know. It's funny. It's funny, it's funny you, you say that. that because our, our chat was people were throwing punches on that this morning. In yeah, the chat. Oh God! Okay. Yeah, because yeah, I when I came into it, they were IJs, yeah, and I would right, slip up and say IJs all the time because in my head that's what they are. Technically, we should be saying Papuan carpet, right, Eric? Well, I think that people don't like the name. Papuan carpets because Why? is it, it of, Papuan python? Because, yeah, because sometimes people will cut it short and say Papuan python, and then it gets confused with the actual one Papuan is this python. big. One and is this big. <laughs> like it is some people. <laughs> yeah, some people call it a West Papuan carpet python. Oh, some people call it um, what's the other name for them? New Guinea carpet python. New Guinea carpet python. I mean, they're they're uh, found in New Guinea, right? I mean, it's right. just the line yeah, of the I mean, sand, really, right? Yeah, and so they're yeah. they're they're on both sides. I think uh, it, most of the ones that we get in the trade are coming from West Papua, so that's why that okay. name is sort of stuck. West Papua and carpet pythons. But, are they trying to set it up so that when somebody goes and actually gets them from New Guinea, they can say these are not? Well, they have the New Guinea ones exactly. So it's like, all right, well, which are totally different than the, the West Papua ones because they don't hatch out red babies. They have uh, this sort of gray look as reduced pattern. Which uh, I don't know if you go on uh, iNaturalist. And you look at some of the ones from the other side of the island, they sort of do look like those New Guineas. I kind of call them Papuan carpet pythons. That's what I call them. That's, yeah. that's where I've gone. And now the Latin has even I changed. do miss the IJ name. because Yeah, that's I saw that, I that you know, with the most recent um, edition book, of, the, yeah. of the book, they're, they're, they're sort of doing some reclassification. Uh, yeah. yeah, they're the same now as Darwin carpets Vergata. and but yeah, they're they're Maria Vergata and it's Darwin's and Cape Yorks. Cape now. Yorks, yeah. Yep. Mm. They're all the it's same. The Cape Yorks you can see because they look identical to what Well, you can also see with the with the Darwins, because it's like, gee, I don't know, where did this oh it, they they yeah, they these looked like they were connected at one point and they were. Yeah. So, and they were, yeah. The yeah. Torres Strait was yeah. one time a br- a land bridge, right. you know, sure. which is how they predict the chondros made it down to uh cape york so exactly so it makes sense to follow all the other animals and do the same so yeah yeah to me that's the perfect chondro is a green snake with the white stripe that to me is yeah i i do like all the others but to me that's like creme de la creme i wanted to post this up real quick because owen sent me a picture of it but i wanted just so the people that are watching could see a picture (laughs) Of an aurora house snake. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They're, they're neat. Where they're different looking. I like it. Oh, yeah. 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 And the thing yeah. is that green can be a real light green and all, or a real dark green. They all had the orange striping and the black sort of stippling on the on the head and, and such. They're, they're really cool animals. That's yeah. such a cool animal. Yeah. 
Another okay. thing that now is on my radar that I didn't need it to be on my radar, but now it's on my radar. It's well, the beauty thing about those Owen is that that they're very small. They're relatively very small snakes, so they don't take up much room. God, it's so, like you know, I I you am, can keep you know fifty of those in the space of one Argentine enclosure, exactly. right? Yeah, well, that's that's the problem. Is a hundred in the retic cage? Exactly. <laughs> that's right. I can keep a whole zoo in there. Yeah, it's a population. It's, I still don't know why you have that thing. I oh, yeah, either. I do. You're yeah, I got to find the right person to take her. Um, so I, I, on one hand, I get the Argentines. On the other hand, I got um, bamboo rat snakes. So it's like yeah. I, 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 my addiction goes through many different levels. So, yeah. Here's a crazy question. And all the snakes that you kept, reptiles that you kept, is there a species that is on your list that either it's, it hasn't become available yet or you just haven't had the opportunity to work with it and you want to? Well, the, you know, the, the Carinata was one. I mean, okay. that's, that's been on my bucket list since, you know, the 90s. Okay. Um, so, and I remember, I guess, uh, back in... To 2010 or so, maybe I, I can't. My timeline's going to be really off there, but I think Terry Phillip had some and bred them. Yep. Yep. Is that right? Yeah, okay. that's about right. Yep. Yep. Yeah. yeah. And um, and I don't know where they all went from there. I don't know if he still has them or not. I haven't talked to Terry in a while. I, I want to say his were somewhat tied up with agreements of zoo stock, which can okay. be difficult to kind of. Yep. Yeah, reptile garden. release out there. Um, I know several zoos that have Caranata have them with the thing of that they will not release them to the public. So um, I'm not sure what ended up happening there, but I know I followed Terry stuff. And I think a couple of years after that, you started seeing them pop up because they were brought in. Um, I know Cameron brought in a bunch uh, mm-hmm. that was resulted in that kind of stuff. And then I think they kind of just trickled in through European legally. readers and stuff yeah. like that legally. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. That way. Um, and then I want to say that there was a little bit of a hang up a couple of years ago about them and importations. Cause I know that um, there was some stuff. Well, I think with, it was that whole thing with Australian animals yeah. in general. Yeah. So a lot of stuff, it, there's no more coming in. So what we have here is what we have. So except Owen Pelly's. And and was, God. Dear God, hopefully. <laughs> and, and and there's one other chondro that that would that definitely be on my bucket list, but probably is a forbidden fruit, and that would be the, you know, like a true Australian yeah. in Cape York. You know, yeah, they're they're pretty neat. Was that they were are. they ever a thing? Ever available? The Cape York chondros was that ever a thing? They're just. Maybe? I mean, unless some got smuggled up to yeah. Indo and then shipped out through that pathway, but. You know, back in you know the late '90s, I was trying to work out a sort of like a genetic fingerprinting with the um, the mm-hmm. Aru's and the Marukis and the and the and the Australian green trees. Right. right. You know, the Aru's are pretty distinct, I guess, in terms of the white being more off the center line. You know, the vertebral stripe. Right. Um, and you know, and even the Marukis and the and the and the true Australians are pretty distinctive too. But they're they're they have a lot of similarities enough to where I think that potentially could there be some, or could there have been some that made their way here and, and represented as Marukis that were in fact, you know, uh, Cape York or something possibly, I don't know. Mm. Or even hybrids, you know, where somebody sure. took an Australian and bred it to an Indonesian and, you know, bastardized it that way and got, you know, got it well, out. You would. Yeah. But, um, but I, I, not to my knowledge is I, I, I don't know if, I, I've never seen one in person. And I don't know if any exist here knowingly. It, it'd be kind of a cool thing because I know they're doing a lot of DNA testing with snakes, mutations, things like that. I, I would wonder if that maybe in a couple of years down the road, DNA testing with sheds to kind of bust up localities almost and see what you might have in a chondro, <laughs> like what's the makeup and things like that. So. I, I mean, I would welcome that kind of stuff. I would bet the Australian green tree keepers would, you know, if they could get their hands on some uh, mosaic or some mm-hmm. uh, all their sickness animals yeah. or whatever, they would send those green animals like in no yeah, time. They, whoop. they drool over our stuff. We drool over their stuff. Over their stuff, yeah. 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 You want what you can't have type of situation. Of course. A hundred percent. Well, like oddly enough, I mean, oddly enough, one of the things even I didn't, 
accumulate enough data to to publish anything. Mm-hmm. We did um, see, and I think this was corroborated in other genetic studies, but oddly enough, the the arus were more genetically similar for the DNA that I was testing mm-hmm. to the Australians than the Australians were to the Marukis, even though the Arukis, Marukis and the Australians look more similar phenotypically. Really? That's weird. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. hmm. Yeah, I guess that would make sense. I mean, it, it, I, nothing surprises me anymore. Yeah. It's like whenever we think we got it down, something happens and we're like, oh, okay. I yeah. have no idea. So something that's changes. awesome, though. As far as, you know, just being in that time period. And actually, you know, I, I, I often wonder for people who have just gotten into it since sort of the computer age, like. Right. I wonder what their perspective of all this is, because. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's a part of me that still yearns for the day of magazines and having to wait to see something. Right. <laughs> right. Well, I'm just right. saying, I mean, I, I don't, yeah. well, I'm just yeah. saying, I don't know about you guys, but I sometimes find myself scrolling right past something where 20 years ago I would have been like, holy shit, 100%. look at that. Yeah. 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 You just, yeah. you just become saturated with so much super cool stuff that I just think it just, I don't know. It almost numbs you. I don't know. Or at least yeah, it does I, for me sometimes. Yeah, I would, man, I would agree to that too, especially because it used to be that there was one or two big reptile shows and you would go and you would see those those wow animals, those big ones. Yes. I know some, some breeders that attend these big shows do hold on to some higher dollar animals or higher value animals in their opinion to bring to like a Daytona or Tinley Park. But now there's so many reptile shows, at least where I'm yeah. at, um, where now it's like you lose the effect of seeing that. Yeah, that what that animal would stop me dead in its tracks. And yeah. then it's like, wow. And then you can like, you kind of you do get oversaturated or overstimulated with it where this doesn't really bring the punches it used to. Um, well, and even but, in your yeah. conversation with Rick Ross, I mean, just this that period from like the 70s into you know, up to around 1990. I mean, there was a whole lot of groundbreaking stuff happening yeah. there yeah. and all of it was all word of mouth. You know, they, they, they started, the um, the guys at the Catoctin zoo started the, you know, the IHS, yeah. I believe. Yeah. And then yeah. from there, that's what split into the breeders expo, I guess, because they wanted to, to do animals there. They want, and the other folks wanted to keep it more or less strictly academic, you know? Mm-hmm. Sure. Um, but you know, I, you, I'm sure you guys have saw, seen some of the um, editions of like the proceedings from some of those, you know, gatherings. Yeah. And it's like, wow, look at this stuff, you know, <laughs> where now it's like, you can just Google any of this stuff up. So it, it was kind of, in a way it was, there's kind of like a, in my view, sort of like a romantic lure about sort of some of the mystery yeah. and, you know, it's yeah. some of the, you know, just some of the things that now you can just, at a whim, just look up. Yeah. And it's kind of one of those things where it's, I've seen so many diamond pythons that, uh, you know, it has <laughs> yeah. to be a real, it has to be a real right. banger when I see it in person. Otherwise I'm like, eh, it's a diamond. Like it. Yeah. I think also too, it's this, um, what is, what have seemed to at least us, uh, I speak for me and I've gotten this under a handle, but like for years it was more about the, the, the chase <laughs> of getting the animal than Hunters, actually yeah. getting the animal, you know, it's like right. the whole, and I think maybe to what you're saying is maybe this is why it's like that, 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 uh, you know, uh, what's the word? Like, I don't know. It just seemed like in like, you know, you would wait for people to produce these clutches and you would be, you know, you'd go to the forum to see them post up the pick and, you know, it, 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 you don't, everything's just so automatic now it's kind of like yeah. to your point you're just scrolling past it and it loses the the same appeal where you know years ago uh yeah it would have you know just blew your socks yeah. off and now i just have more of appreciation of the animals that i have you know like i don't need four more diamond pythons to appreciate the ones that i have because <laughs> you know you you, no, but those four that you got better produce me some babies, God damn it! Oh, they're looking because good. I'm getting yeah. tired of waiting. They're looking good. Looks good. Fingers crossed. Good, man. That's it's awesome. And that's a cool species that's really seemingly getting a little more of a foothold in the captive, yeah. you know, yeah. realm. I know Buddy Bashemi's been 
having real good success. Yeah. yeah. You know, breeding diamonds. And so yeah, he's been breeding them for, like, I should have jumped on those five, several years. years yeah. 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 He, um, buddy, buddy hooked me up with my first rhino rat snakes. Um, oh, yeah. He yep. He gave me a chondro and then I, <laughs> I sent it back before I could kill it. So, um, and he's like, well, do you want to do rhinos for the chondro? And I said, yes. And those rhinos have been fantastic for me yeah. because people will break down your door for a funny looking snake with a weird nose. So, I know, right? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, whatever. And Buddy and I go way back, you know. Um, in fact, I was the one who got him into the green trees. Ah, um, there you go. So he and I met through a mutual friend through mountain biking. Okay. And oh, so, really? okay. Yeah, a friend, a, a longtime friend of mine, new Buddy, and he's like, you know, I got a friend of mine who who is into reptiles too, and I'm like, really? And so we connected at the time. He was breeding like um, like Maclots pythons. Um, yes, spotted pythons. Yep. Yeah, and um, and Dumeril's, uh monitors, and um, and so he, he he we we got him into the into the green tree craze, you know, and then he he took off with it, and has kept trucking ever since. Yeah, yeah. He told yeah, us he, about this one Dumeril's he had to go get, like it didn't it like <laughs> break out of the box or something in the plane or like you know it 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 defecated in the box and he had to go on the tarmac to yeah. get it. Yeah. So I remember him telling us about that one, but, um, yeah, he'll be back on the show in a couple of yeah, weeks to grab him at some point. Oh, that's yeah. cool. Yeah. 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 He'll be back. Yeah. He, uh, I made a post about wanting to have more Condro people on and he's like, Condro people, you say, oh, okay. <laughs> just like, okay, yeah. Out of ether. yeah. <laughs> Anytime, buddy. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. so. Uh, that's cool. Yeah. That's awesome. All right. Uh, I don't know. Anything else you wanted to hit on? Uh, you want to throw out there for the the people to discuss or hear? I'm talking to you, Owen. <laughs> oh, I got nothing. <laughs> I got nothing, man. It's, I've, I have I do have a new appreciation for Condros. Good. Probably still not going to get any. Like, yeah, you know, no, you I have to I, have them to appreciate them. That'll that'll be my sunset snake when I've decided my career is over. I'll retire with some Condros unless yeah, Gila monsters go. become a thing. And then sorry. Yeah. Gila monsters are going to win on that one. Yeah. Do you, you don't want to yeah. breed them just to say that you bred them? No, because no. I have my yeah. own like, you know, it. it's. I mean, you've done so good with all these. But, what, but like, I you mean, know, come it, on. you nailed white lips. Yes, Carinata, the yeah, mad hogs, the blonde hogs. Got you quite know, quite a list behind you, my man. I do, but I don't want to just get a pair of snakes to be like, ha ha, and then be done with it. You know, it, it's plus the breedings of the stuff that I like are, like I told you, I hatched out nine baby white lips. Three of them are mine. They're not leaving. And now I sat down and figured out I have like 10, 10 white lips. Why do I have 10 white lips? Like it's. Because <laughs> you're afraid one's going to look like Mr. Blue of the white lip. Not, that that <laughs> doesn't true. exist in white lips. <laughs> <laughs> they don't, they don't change color as they get bigger. I know what they you never like know. They I know. They had red ones and <laughs> the red ones are different. That is a different thing. Like oh, it is. Okay. Yeah. So I, there's a lot of that kind of stuff. So yeah, I would. I would not add chondros just to breed them. If maybe I get further down the road, that might change. But um, I'm going to give night, them a whirl uh, again at some point. So yeah, we'll see. I'd rather get Owen Pellies. So. Yeah, wow. yeah, I guess uh, there's a few of those floating around, isn't there? Australia. Yeah, yeah. they're all in yeah. Australia. Well, I think there's a few of them floating around in the U.S. Mm -hmm. too. <laughs> That's why I, I thought I heard something of that I effect, would, well, they, they they appeared on a on a zoo list, so they were able to get here. Um, whether or not anybody found a way to get them off that zoo list or into a zoo, I don't know. Mm -hmm. But I would welcome it because I think yes. they're very cool. Yes, very yeah. cool snake, very very cool yep. snake. Well, uh, yeah, I appreciate you. Uh, yeah, spending thanks, the night Tim. With this us has and... been awesome to kind yeah, of it's fun cool connecting with it. you guys. You know, yeah, yeah, hundred percent. And I'm, I'm glad it's funny. Up, I, I, go ahead. I'm saying I'm glad you brought up iCast because you know we still have fond memories of that. Oh yeah, and uh, all that fun stuff, um, and uh, hanging out with all the Condro guys on there. So, well, and Buddy was one of the three main players for that too. You know, so yeah. he, and there were there was supposed to be another another iCast, and it just never 
yeah. um, came to fruition. But, uh, you know, it needs to happen again. And, you know, and that's the other thing with the Condor community. You know, when you think about it, you know, I guess they sort of caught, they started these so-called fests. Yes. You know? Yes. You know, the Condor Fest, right? Um, yep. They also, um, you know, we had those symposiums Mark Twig put on out in St. Mm-hmm. Louis. Yeah. 2004, yeah. five and six. And that, that was really good. Yeah. yeah. Carpet Fest was a direct ripoff. Of yeah. We, we, Fest, we stole sure. that. We <laughs> stole it from you. We, we, sure, we, 100%. we admit it every time it is brought up. Yes. We took it. <laughs> so. Well, that actually, yeah. So that morphed out of, um, so apparently trooper before I ever met him would have these gatherings at his house. Okay. Mm-hmm you know, select people, some from the zoo, some from, you know, the private sector. And then as I got to meet him or know him, I became part of that. And so did Sean and a couple others. And so then um, Buddy Getzker got into the fray. And so he had like a bigger house pool, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So he wanted to do it on a more grand scale. And of course he had Trooper and Eugene, as part of it. Um, so then it sort of morphed into like a multi-state thing. You know, we have Mark Twig bringing in grass fed beef from Missouri and people, you know, bringing stuff from all over the place. And it became this, you know, this, this big, bigger than life event for a day. Um, so I think we did that a few couple of different years. Right. Yeah. Carpet Fest I has think, very quickly become that as well. And we keep. Yeah, no, through. but bigger now, you know, yeah. and, and yeah. much more, and much more, I guess, you know, I mean, it's much more frequent. I mean, you guys are pretty, pretty good about holding. And, yeah. and there were some regional ones there for a while. No, yeah, still, for a while there yeah. were a bunch. Yeah. and um, I think it's important, you know, especially yeah. in today's age, right? Everybody's yeah. behind a keyboard. Nobody ever talks to anybody face to face and gets to know the actual people that are behind yeah. that, you know, the keyboard. And sometimes you find out that. You know, you, I don't Somebody know. Somebody lives close to you. Yeah. You know, with yeah. all that stuff, you know. And, well, and there's a lot of work good, to do, but I mean, anybody you talk to that's ever been to one of those events will say it was one of the best times they ever had, you know. It and, is. And, and it's, uh, it's hilarious because the main question I get from people is like, do I have to keep carpets to come? And I'm like, no, no. <laughs> no yeah. but, but I mean, a lot of the people there show are, your carpet you, pipe on, like, or you cannot like, enter. You cannot come in. Are you serious? Yeah. I mean, that's the only reason I bought the IJs. I thought oh, I had to, you know, well, you know, be part of the, you know, be part. <laughs> have to be plugged into the Morelia somehow. It's like, yeah, right. yeah. 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 Have to sell those dirty brown that. snakes somehow. Yeah. <laughs> keep that perpetuating that rumor. That's funny. Hey, it's cool. weird because you said you bought carpets at iCast, and I'm like, crap, I was set up at iCast. Did he buy my carpets? And then it's like, IJs, nope, never produced those, so okay, we're good. <laughs> like, he did yeah. not get mine. <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah, that was that was, a, that was a real good time. I really enjoyed that. that yeah. They did a great job with that. Um, but All right. Awesome. Well, awesome. again, thanks for coming on, Tim. This has been great. We love this kind of Herp Talk stuff because it's just him and me can geek out about how. Yeah, no, I appreciate it, man. Any, yeah. Any, yeah, anytime. And, and you know, if you ever decide to, you know, broaden things out, I know uh, some people have talked about trying to get, um, you know, several people, like almost like a round table kind of thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, be happy we, to. Okay. We've done a couple Not round tables and I do not mind doing them again because it's like getting it's like cramming a bunch of really good um breeders into a box and making them answer your questions. So it's like, yeah, yeah I've locked you all in this room. So yeah, I like that. Right. And to see their different approaches. Exactly. Is, is also, I like I love that kind of stuff. Yeah. Well, different things come up too with the interactions, yeah. you know, because yeah. sometimes yeah. you just think of something talking to somebody you wouldn't have thought of otherwise. And Sure. It's, it's it's a forum live, which I love, and and mm-hmm. I think we we miss out on a lot with this stuff. So definitely, we couldn't we can try to. Well, talk we, to we have two table. round tables coming up: pygmy python round table and mm-hmm. a uh, oh cool pop one carpet round table. So 
pop one we card. We'll decide around which one we will call it from. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, we'll get it. That we'll bring that up, we'll, and then it will be decided. Oh God, that'll will be, be the be whole show. Everybody will yeah. be fighting about what we. Well, call that's it. why we're going to le- bury that question. Don't it's like start with that one. Yeah, but <laughs> well, we need to because I can't go to the shows and sell these damn things. Oh, I don't know. know if I put <laughs> NG, IJ, whatever. I mean, I just it's a carpet. All right, that's all I know. Somebody yeah. tell me what this yeah. is. Yeah. NG like, slash <laughs> IJ slash PCP. <laughs> can't go. Well, wrong. The labels like this long on the little deli cup. Like yeah, yeah. no, it's no. no. Very cool. Do you have do you vend shows regularly? I mean, on occasion, I mean, yeah, usually right. some local shows. Uh, James Optal and I did um, one of the um, Breeders Expos in Daytona. Okay. Like um, back in 2018. Okay. And cool. then cool. you know, just a smattering of uh, local shows. I mean, it's okay. it depends on if I have anything you know, gotcha. th- that I'm able to sell. But, um, but of late, yeah, like I said, I've been getting into some tortoises. I got a nice group of pancake tortoises, a nice yes. little group of Hermans. Nice. Um, even trying to, for the first time, um, hibernating, brumating the, um, well, we did the two males that we have for the Hermans uh-huh. because they're from this, a similar climatic region. Okay. So I got two males sitting outside in their enclosure, hoping they make, <laughs> they come out next spring. <laughs> you know, yeah. I mean, at this point, I know they're like eight or nine inches down in the soil, and pretty much gave them what I know that they need or what they rely yeah. on to overwinter in their, you know, oh, home yeah. habitat. So we'll see. Best of luck so, with that. That's cool. Yeah, that's awesome. I love that stuff. Yeah, well, it's just you know, just trying to you know push push it a little bit in terms of just trying to do different things. And, you know, yeah. it's definitely been a learning experience. In fact, uh, the pancakes in the Hermans spend, you know, most of the spring, summer and fall outside. Yeah. Okay. And then I bring the pancakes come in for the winter because they're, you know, from a more, you know, arid mm-hmm. year round um, location, but the um, Hermans being from like the Mediterranean and all, they're very similar to, to our weather here. Right. So, but it's, it's cool having them outside. I mean, it's a little nerving at first because it's like out of your control, so to speak, but they, unlike snakes, although some snakes do this, but in usually not in the best of ways, the the tortoises definitely morph into different creatures outside. I mean, Mm -hmm. something with the sun and I've seen some snakes do it, but normally what that means is they become nasty and mean thinking, hey, yeah, man, I'm, free. Yeah, I'm in the wild now. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm not handleable anymore. Don't get yeah. me. Right. So, um, but the tortoises are a bit different. So it's been a lot of fun doing that. That's, That's cool. cool. That's really yeah. cool. All right. Well, we'll keep an eye out to see. Yeah. Uh, see what I, I want to know if those Hermans come out of it. You know, we, we only have. Yeah, I'm hoping so. Yeah. But, uh, but I've been breeding the pancakes. I'm slowly getting an army of those. I've, Two I hatched out last year and two more eggs hatching or two more eggs incubating now. So because they only lay one egg at a time. That's and 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 twice a year. So the reproductive output's pretty low, but they're they're fun. Yeah. I love pancakes. I I just I can't. There's, there's, would you no. trade Mort for a pancake? Yes, I, trade Mort for, <laughs> I would trade my wife Sulcata for an army of pancakes. Oh God, yes. Yeah, so, is it a male or female Sulcata? Boy, yeah. Oh God, they can be pretty destructive. <laughs> oh God, he's uh, and he charges me. He doesn't charge my. Oh wife. yeah. He, oh, yeah, he charges me. He charges you? Oh yeah, he's a. Oh jerk. yeah. Oh wow. Okay. <laughs> yeah, they, I've seen um, some videos of people who have, like kept them in like a like a bedroom. Yep, thinking yep. it's a good idea, give them the space, and they the make drywall. holes in the drywall. <laughs> man, they just tear. They they just make a mess of everything. Yep. <laughs> I I made him an enclosure in our basement. Yeah, that's like, and I got like thick plywood, and then every year he goes out for springtime, and it's like we have to rehab the indoor enclosure of like what he has scraped down and, and what he has hit with his, his fork and stuff like that and just wandering around. And it's just like, this year's going to be a major fixing because we have to reseal it and all that fun stuff. But I haven't seen this, this, I haven't seen Mort in a long time. And I just went to Owen's house like what a month ago. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, what? Jesus. The- <laughs> 
<laughs> he spends half the year wandering my yard eating. Thing, man. Of course he's <laughs> yeah. 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 That's funny. Yeah. And he's only half grown. Yeah. I yeah. Know. yeah. Oh, wow. Okay, yeah. man. That's why I want the Gila monsters. When the tortoise is outside, I can use the cage for Gila monsters. So, okay. Yeah. What happens when the tortoise comes back? They inside? go to their winter enclosure. See? Oh, see? Okay. Yeah. You hibernate the Gila's. <laughs> Oh, I see. Oh, you have a system worked out. It's all coming together. Yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. It's all figured out. But very good. All right. Very good. Well, uh, well, cool, gentlemen. Well, I appreciate it, man. Anytime. This yeah. was awesome. Now we'll definitely uh, have you come back on to school us some more stuff. This is awesome. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully, uh, come back. You know, catch you guys on the next uh, carpet fest you guys have up there. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Totally. I think I've only been to one that one year, and then I had, uh, I guess, pandemic and other things kind of. Yeah, yeah, all that kind of paused stuff. Stuff then, but, Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, we're, we're, we this year back. was our first year back, so um, uh, we'll definitely we have make to pick sure a that. Date. <laughs> yes, I know. Talk to Rob yeah. about that while you're herping. Uh, I will mention weekend. it to Master Stone. I, yeah. You know, in between Diamondbacks, I'll be like, "So Carpet Fest." Yeah. So if he leaves me out there, it's your fault. So. <laughs> Gotcha. His plot to be the new co-host. Is that I mean, the that idea? Is his, that is his drive. I know what he's doing. <laughs> Things I don't um, know, but I don't know. Awesome. So. All right. Cool. Uh, okay. T- uh, Tim, did you want to throw anything out there as far as like website where people can get in touch with you if they want to purchase Facebook animals? Or, or would you prefer I, that nobody talks to you? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I, I really just email or whatever. I mean, gotcha. feel free if anybody reaches out to you to, you know. I mean, I guess they can hit me up on Facebook. I'm I'm there and okay. So cool, yeah, um, awesome. And a quick do us for us uh, NPR Network, Marine Python Radio, uh, Marine Python Radio dot com. Um, what else do we got? Uh, oh man, I'm drawing oh, blank. I'm you can on. You're doing good. You're doing okay. Power through. <laughs> we have uh, cold blooded caffeine, which yes. is uh, our carpets and coffee blend of coffee. Good. Uh, that Good. You can check out. So uh-huh. good cheats. And then we have cold blooded cafe. Those are the rats. There's the yes. rodents. Uh huh. Get the two mixed up. No, you're not. Be, they will not work. <laughs> it could be a bad day. Yeah, it's a bad morning. Yeah. Uh, uh, yep. There is a uh, NPR um, on the cold blooded caffeine. You can put in NPR. And you'll get ten percent off your order, and you get a little kickback uh, if you buy the carpets and coffee from the affiliate link. Um, and the uh, cold blooded cafe. Yeah, that's hard to keep these. I could do this, but <laughs> yeah, I, I'm having more fun watching this. <laughs> okay. So yeah, um, <laughs> the cold blooded cafe. You put in NPR ten to get ten percent off of your first order of rodents. Uh, but you should also follow them on all their social medias because they have multiple sales and they do multiple things right now. I think they were asking for what people would want to see as far as different feeders to be offered, different things to be posted. It was all on their uh, uh, Facebook page. So go check them out. Um, also, uh, the spring store is getting worked on. Go check out the new website. Eric's been working on it. It's got all the different things that you would need to know about carbon pythons. Yep, Morelia. Yeah. Not just carpet pythons, Morelia. Carpets, Sorry. Green Apologies. trees. Yeah, see, else. see, it's more fun on that Owen side. Isn't it? Yeah. So, um, you know, Owen Pelly's isn't Morelia, but still. it's Morelia. It's Morelia. I, I deemed it Morelia. I don't care what they say. Okay. Um, and then, of course, the Patreon. Go check that out. We're going to be doing some updates to that. Um, that's it. That's all we have for everybody tonight. So, we'll say thanks everybody for listening, and we'll catch everybody back here next week for some more Morelia Python radio. And, and I need everybody to cross their fingers that I quickly find an Eastern Diamondback so that I can not feel the pressure of disappointing Miss Master Stone when I'm in <laughs> You're going to find it. Goddamn right I'm going to find it. Because I'm not there. It. Yeah, well, yeah. yeah. And I can't yeah. check that species off my yeah, rattlesnake yeah. list. This is the, this is the black tail all over again. You got yeah. every time I'm not near you. Between you the two of us, we'll hit every sports, throat in the yeah, U.S. <laughs> I love it. Between the two of us, we'll get the rattlesnakes. Rob's going to get it without us. Yeah. All right, that's it, everybody. Thank you. End the show.